So hi, uh, I'm Alex. I'm the talent exec for the Southwest. Um, I work for BFI Network. Now, this whole scheme, you might know a little bit about it already, you might not, is called Short It Out. Um, Short It Out is come off the back of the lockdown and everything we've been going through at the moment. And we're trying to get filmmakers to think a bit more creatively about how they can make content and what they can do at the moment. So as we're chatting with Desiree, in the background, the lovely Jess from Network is going to be on the chat, kind of asking any answering any questions there and just kind of letting us know what's going on um, and she's going to be our kind of tech guru so she's there in the background looking after us today and then we've also so as we go through if anyone does have any questions now we can only take questions through the Q&A section so for everyone that should be at the bottom so if you make sure to ask your questions in there and we'll go through those as much as we can obviously we probably won't be able to answer everyone but we'll try our best to get through them now, if anyone's watching Facebook Live, if you can make sure that you'll have to join the Zoom to ask questions as well, you won't be able to do it through here. Now, short it out for anyone, like I say, has already been kind of through this process. So this is our first live event, but we have already been putting up loads of content out on socials and through the Encounters Film Festival website. Now, if you head over, so it's just encounters.film forward slash short it out. And there's loads of kind of resources and tips and, and short film playlists for you to have a look at all kind of around DIY filmmaking and how you might be able to make a film in lockdown. So what we're inviting you to do at the moment until the 4th of July, 4th of June, sorry, you need to make a short film that's 90 seconds or under and you then just need to share it with us on socials and just use the hashtag short it out and then we'll kind of look at those as they come through share a best of the week um, and then at the end we'll look at them all and decide whether to put some of those onto the BFI um, player as part of the archive that they're creating at the moment around the lockdown so do check that out afterwards anyone who's interested in actually making and um, producing some work during this time now so we're really thrilled to have Desiree Banner here with us today. Um, so Desiree, uh, you probably already know all about her, but I'll just give you a quick lowdown. Um, so she's obviously a really multi-talented filmmaker and has got a really kind of impressive back catalogue of work, including most, probably most recently the Channel 4 series, The Bisexual, um, the feature film, The Miseducation of Cameron Post, and her debut feature um, back in 2014, Appropriate Behaviour. And then if you're going right, right back and what you might have seen as Sherry on socials was The Slope, the 2010 um, web series. Cool, so welcome Desiree. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And thanks for coming everybody. How's everything been for you with the lockdown? How's it been going? You're in New York at the moment, is that right? Um, this morning I, FaceTime watched my grandma get buried in Iran. So that was intense. It's tough. Yeah. And it was fucking intense. Like some days you're like, this is wonderful. Everyone stop so I can catch up and I can like get up on my to-do list. And then you get sick and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to die. And then you get better and you're like, new lease on life. Everything's fine. Capitalism sucks. Let's start over. And then you know, someone dies and you're like, how do I support my family? How do I support like grief? How do I go through those rituals without touching someone? Um, this is fucking intense. It's yeah. I think it's so intense and everything's so intensified by the nature of just not being able to do the things you usually would to go through those processes. Like you say, you want to just be able to grieve now, but you've, you've not had that kind of natural output to be able to go to the funeral to attend that and to be around your family and friends. And I think it's one of the really toughest things at the moment for everyone. And also there's like, there's a lot of fear. Like I had to tell my mother and for a minute I was like, well, I should just call her. I can't be there in person. What if I get sick? And then I was like, what if I get her sick? And then it was like, no, I mean, I kind of think it's more important to support someone physically and like touch and I've been like touching my mom all week and I hadn't touched anyone in a while. And at first it felt really unnatural. And I don't know. It was just fucking intense. And it's not, I mean, I can't even begin to imagine people who are physically dealing with this in, in hospitals. I can't imagine what it is to lose someone you weren't. I mean, she was my grandmother. She was old. Like it's one thing to lose a grandmother. It's another thing to lose someone that is like completely shocked to you. 
all of this is to say that it's a lot of ups and downs and um is there anything you've found that's kind of really helped you through this time in terms of the lockdown? Anything you've, any new things you've taken up or anything that you've been doing to kind of keep busy? Bathing. <laughs> like, keeping a schedule. I think um, for me, routine has been really good. I'm, I'm working through this, so writing is really helpful. Um, It's funny, I do have a laundry list of things, but then I also feel like whatever your reaction to this is so personal, like it's all like, what are your Achilles heels as a human and how are they manifesting themselves? Um, but yeah, I think for me, finding what's comforting. And to me, that's like having the, actually, like on a tangible level, this is a filmmaker talk. I think this is relevant. Um, some friends and I who are also writing right now, um, we meet usually at like 1230 because we're all different time zones. So like 1230 New York time for me, we meet on Skype and then we're like, okay, we're writing. And so someone sets a timer and for an hour, we don't move. Like we we sit and write and then in an hour we take a 10 minute break and then in 10 minutes we come back and we work another hour and we do this for three hours a day and that's actually helped me a lot just knowing that they're there that that's the plan that I have a place to be uh has been really tangibly helpful in terms of keeping sane and keeping focused yeah, because you usually tend to co-write, don't you, with the projects that you've been working on. How has that process been working in lockdown or is that something that you've still been able to do and, and what's your kind of thinking about what, how, why do you kind of work with a co-writer usually? What do you tend to get from that relationship? Well, I don't work with a co-writer. I work with Cecilia, who yeah. is my like partner professionally. So I work with the woman who produces all my work and who's been my best friend for the past 15 years. So uh, we have been writing a script and this, I think, was supposed to finish this week. We'll see. I'm, we're doing the, the first pass at our next script. And it's for each one, it's very different. Uh, how that looks. I think for Cameron Post, we were both in the room uh, at the same time. I was living in her apartment for a lot of writing Cameron Post. For the bisexual, there was more back and forth, but we were all both, we were at the same time, we were both in London. Um, now that I'm back in New York, I feel like this has been a bit more staccato. And also this script is takes place in Iran. So, and is much more inspired by my family. So it's been a lot harder for, us to split that weight equally. So how it's been working this week or this past few months has been that we speak in the mornings. Like when I wake up in New York um, and once we finally get on the phone, it's about 1 p.m. her time, 9 a.m., 8.30 a.m. my time. And so we talk it out, like we talk plot and I get my marching orders for the day. And then during that, uh, three hour writing uh, block with my friends, I execute what we discussed in the morning. Okay. That sounds great. Good kind of way to keep that momentum going. Um, we'll move on to kind of talking a little bit more about your kind of process in terms of getting content off the ground and going right back to sort of the beginning <laughs> of your career and the way that you've gotten into the industry. Maybe talk a little bit about the slope and the context of using that web series as a platform for you in terms of making your first piece of work and how you kind of kept motivated to make one episode after another and that sort of continuation of a series. So the series started as homework. We were, um, I was in grad school at the time for directing and Ingrid, the co-creator of the show, was my girlfriend. And I was in a class where the homework was to make a, to make anything. It was like, all right, at the end of the semester, I've, um, I've, the teacher booked a screening room and 
publicized it to the school and was like, all right, you have this screening. What are you going to make? And then through the course of the semester, he shared with us like films he loved, articles and interviews with directors he loved, just inspiring work. And he was like, you can workshop what you're working on or not, but this is kind of choose your own adventure, like take what you need. So, you know, we watched like Shirley Clark, we watched Cassavetes. We watched, this actually, I mean, weirdly enough, this is, I'm gonna name drop here, but the class was taught by Ira Sachs, the queer filmmaker. Uh, and I have to credit him because directing is such a weird thing to teach. Like some teachers would come in and be like, here's a checklist of all the things you need to prep on the day, X, Y, Z. And I think that's such a bullshit way to go about it because every director is like a snowflake, like, you know, like so many different ways to direct a scene, so many different ways to approach and there's no right or wrong. It's just the result and there's just taste. Uh, so for, so for a class to just say like, take what you need and here's like, you have to deliver a product was really good for me because I didn't subscribe to the modes of directing that the other teachers were really adamant about. And I wasn't making work under their tutelage that I was proud of. And of course I love this at the last minute, uh, the film and I remember I was joking around with Ingrid and I had also like just come out of the closet and she was my first like real girlfriend and I was noticing that like when we talked about being gay like it felt super homophobic like it was just I was we were laughing at like the way lesbians dressed and talked and it all felt very like oh wow we're really self-hating homophobic lesbians like for women who just came out and are who are holding I mean she had been out for a long time but like for someone whose life has really been touched heavily by being gay I sound like a bigot and we thought that was like a Ingrid was like that's funny like you should write that for your short and it kind of grew from there it was like okay well what's this couple this and what are they doing and what's happening and then so that's how it started and it wasn't it didn't we didn't go into it with this idea that it's going to be this web series it was just like that's a funny conversation what if there were two lesbians who kind of hated each other and ha or hated themselves and hated all gays and what would their conversations look like if you said all the un pc things that you're not supposed to say out loud but like maybe you kind of sort of feel uh like the least mature version of you and so it was really nice because we had a screening set up for so for so soon and it's funny on lockdown i keep thinking it would have been i have so many ideas for slope episodes right now like there's something about confines be there them budgetary production time restraints i think are really great for making things and um that's how it went with the first episode we made the first episode really quickly it was like i had an hour before class our friend held the camera we did a couple of takes it was over the next day like we i was i edited together really badly i'm a terrible editor and then we screened it for the class and it was the first time i screened something that i because i had done theater growing up and i had never felt with film that I had an audience in my hands. And this was the first time that I screened something and I was like, oh, that's the feeling. Like That's what it feels like to have an audience in the palm of your hand. And that's why we made a second one. And it was just to make our friends laugh. So the second one was just like, with a, we asked some of our classmates and we asked our friend Charles to be in it. And it was just like more of a flex, like more of like, we're, it was my last year of classes. So I was like, all right, I'll do something for like end of year stuff. So. And then people really liked that. So then it became like, okay, if we write, write it on Monday, passing the computer back and forth, and then we shoot it Wednesday, and I edit it Thursday night, or you, we, we edit it back and forth too. And then we had to upload it every Saturday. Like we had some, some restrictions for ourselves, just because we were doing other things too. Um, that's how it came about. And then we just up loaded them and they're really, as you can see, they're shitty. Like the production value is nil. The editing skills, not great. Like, and, and the script thrown together, but it, uh, Oh, I think we might have lost your, oh, there we go. 
No, we're back again. Sorry, just a few. Just tech, just audio going, put you back. <laughs> no, that's great. I think it's a good example of just kind of getting on with it, making something, having some content, because at the end, that's the hardest thing is to just get that content and have it there with you to do something well, with. Also to follow your first impulse. Like I think a lot of the problem of moving forward is that there are so many different seeds and branches that this could go off into. And of course, we're all such educated viewers that it's like very easy to get in your own way and say like, okay, well then here's the flaw there and, and it's not quite perfect and this isn't quite perfect. And you really can um, just get in your own way. And I think there was something about committing to having it on the internet every week that helped us lose our own perfectionism. And also it was like, who was watching? Like no one, we didn't care. Like there were no, there was no judge and jury. There was no festival to apply to. There was no money to be made off of this. It was purely, it was the first experience I had of having fun making things. And I actually think it's really important to have fun making things. Of course, like the process of making things can be really miserable at times and that's just the way it is. You have to persevere through that. And that show definitely becomes miserable if you continue watching We Break Up. Like, we completely <laughs> broke up while making it, wrote yeah. it, and just, like, by the end of it, hated each other. Um, but, like, I still was really passionate about making it and ended up finishing it without her because it, she just didn't want to anymore. And I was like, great, fine. I <laughs> That's <not> like, <laughs> that. That's great. Do you think there was any... Um, any particular sort of mistakes or lessons in, that you learn on the slope that sort of you carry through to your feature films? So I definitely learned to have a good time. Like I think, and what it is to chase the funny. Um, in terms of mistakes, I think that like it only got better from there. Like, yeah, it, looks, it's, it's not perfect, but I it was actually losing that perfectionism and embracing mistakes and kind of making the mistakes its shining quality. Mm. And that's what I think is true of appropriate behavior. I think that's true of like each thing subsequent, uh, subsequently like improved in production value, improved in, in um, scope. But at the same time, they're very, they're handmade. And I, I don't know. I never, I think what I learned a bit about it from that experience was like, I don't, this is going to be a hard jump, but like in film school, there were a couple of like names floating around us and some of the students got very obsessed and I did at first too with the idea of like attaching yourself to a name, having a very important EP, having or like assisting a director who's very famous and then climbing up that ladder and getting like impressing that famous guy and like getting him to take you on. And I think there were moments where I definitely felt like if I didn't convince a powerful person that I was someone worth investing in, that I was fucked. And before we made the slope, I had made a short film that I sent to 30 festivals and got rejected by almost all of them. Uh, like $1,000 in entry fees, all rejections, and no one saw that film. And I remember thinking like, oh, I can't convince anyone that I'm worth taking a risk on. Like that's a really, like I'm fucked. Like my work doesn't like attract anybody. And this has been a reoccurring theme in my, my professional growth has been like, stop looking for someone to take a chance on you and just prove your worth. Like let the work do the talking. Don't, with the slope, it was like, there was no seal of approval. People told their friends, told their friends, told their friends. And every week there were more viewers suddenly. Um, and it was the same with appropriate behavior. Like there was, I applied to all the grants all of the, the labs, all of the different young filmmaker like Gravitas mark of approval and was rejected by all of them, all of them. Cameron Post I applied to the Sundance labs with, rejected. 
I, even after I screened appropriate behavior there, like every time I've been like, please, please like me, they're like, no thanks. But that's okay. Like, I think what I learned from that was like, you create your own space, you prove your own worth, you find a way to make it happen. And you don't, the experiences I've had of looking over at my peers who have been very good on paper and who've got, who's gotten like, who, who have people who have gotten someone powerful and um, famous to sign on, that person is never as invested as you are. That person is never going to give you what you need, like, or what you depend on them for. Like it works for people, but not quite in the same way as an equal. And it's, for me, it's really important to have someone I'm in bed with be my equal and need it and want it the way that I do. And that's why I work so well with Chichilia, who is my producing and writing partner, because we're both invested. We're both here for it. We're not auditioning for each other. There's no hierarchy. And I, I, I never want to be in a room where I'm in out of my depth. So that's what it showed me. It was like, if, if it's just you in the park with like a fucking iPhone, you're still making a movie. It's fine. You're making it work. And that was a better position for me than to have been on a set with uh, hundreds of people. That situation would have swallowed me and I never would have made work that mattered to me because I think I would have been swallowed by it. And I think the same would have been true for appropriate behavior. Cameron Post was a really tiny production. Um, but it was slightly larger. Like, I think for me personally, it's been really great to earn my space with each one and get a little bit, a little bit uh, more ambitious as I go. And how did you find that first leap in between the slope and appropriate behavior? What was the process there for you in terms of getting, you know, what point was the idea at when you took it to the studio or to the exec producer? Yeah. That <laughs> well, not studio, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, production company. <laughs> big difference. Well, production, it was to Chile. Like, uh, so what happened was, while I was making the second season of The Slope, and, I mean, things were going, it was intense. Things were going really well. Like, every week the show was having more view. Like, I, like every week there was just a sign. It wasn't overnight. It was just like, you know, we would get a piece of press that mattered to us. We would get an, an email from someone that like, it was a, some kind of sign, like this is going well, this is reaching a, a new platform for us. Um, but as it was getting better and, and we were feeling more confident about our work, our relationship was atrophying and the making of it was getting harder and harder but my ambition always trumps my like personal comfort. So I was writing a feature as we were doing the second season, I was writing the first draft of appropriate behavior. And I felt like we need to like, but I was also really obsessed with making my first feature. To me, it was like losing my virginity. I was like, I must do this. This is what separates the men from the boys. I am a man. Like, you know, like it was, it was a real marker for me. So uh, I had one goal in my mind and it was like, how do we make, um, a feature version of this because we have a modest audience. We have a, an idea of what it is. It's this couple that's kind of unlikable, but like honest and, and like a Larry David-esque dyke. So that was like what I had in my head. And I started writing it. And then the problems came, you know, it was like, well, Ingrid doesn't want to do it with me. Like I started writing it and gave Ingrid and was like, Ingrid, join me. Let's co-write it but it wasn't working. So it was like, okay, then great, edit. I'll write it myself. And then I wrote a draft myself and I was planning on shooting it on the weekends. Or no, okay, I had, it was, it was inspired by scenes from a marriage. That's what I did. I wrote a script that was 12 scenes and it was each, I was gonna shoot a scene a month. And uh, I would shoot it at locations that I knew around Brooklyn. So the way that we shot the slope. And I would just take out a loan and shoot it um, on favors mostly. So I thought I could do it for like 10 grand. Um, and like pay for lunch and use my school's equipment and just ask for favors. And that was the first draft of the script. And I shared it with Cecilia as my friend to just be like, will you read this and tell me what you think? And do you have any notes? I'm gonna shoot it this year. 
um, she read it and she was like, I think that you should rewrite this. I have some really specific notes, but I think you should wait and I, let me produce it and let's shoot it all in one go. Like she's like, throw out the 12 month uh, structure. And I was like, great, fine. And so for over the course of a year, she get, asked me questions and kind of massaged this new structure out of me. And so instead of scenes from marriage, I watched Annie Hall and I was like, all right, I'll steal this structure because I've always been really bad at structure. <laughs> and I straight up just stole it from movies I liked. And then the thesis statement became like, okay, what if you started out knowing this couple would break up and then you watch them like the journey of their relationship. Could you still root for this couple, even though you knew inevitably they were supposed to break up and they weren't supposed to get, be together, but it was this girl's first like love story with another woman. Mm. And that's how it, that script got structured. And over the course of the year that I was rewriting and applying for grants that I never got, Chichilia raised money through, I believe it's called the EIS scheme in the UK. So it was like a tax incentive scheme um, with small donations from many different parties. It's interesting to know. I've got a question here around um, being a queer screenwriter or filmmaker and that kind of you touched upon this a little bit around having what it may be seen as a quite niche audience in terms of where your material might go and whether you had any advice around kind of making your work feel appropriate to mainstream audiences or kind of being able to persuade production companies that it may be appeal to more than just the LGBTQ um, audiences. I don't know if it's my job to convince someone that it could appeal. I think it's my job to make something that I think is really funny. But like people look at this differently. My editor and I fight over this because she's writing something for the first time and I'm EPing and she's like well the odd i like this but the audience might not like it and i kind of don't give a shit like i feel like it's i give a shit of course i want an audience to be entertained but my i very much feel like if it's holding my attention then it will hold your attention and i have a short attention span i'm really like as much as i'm the nature of who I am is is niche. Like I'm an Iranian American bisexual. Like that is pretty out there in terms of like liberal bougie bullshit outliers, if you're gonna like tell your story. But at the same time, I was raised on clueless. Like I I I think that, I mean, also like corporate behavior is like 40% fart jokes. Like, I, I just think that um, it's such a waste of time to burn your energy worrying about how people will interpret you as opposed to just being you. So it seems like, I, I don't know. I feel like if a production gives someone something irresistible, that's how I feel. Like if I am gonna pitch to someone, I wanna give them a package that if I saw it, I was like, fuck yeah, let's do that. And if I feel that way about what I'm saying and they don't, we shouldn't work together. Like I shouldn't try to trick you into investing in me because yeah. I can't deliver trickery. I can give you what I think is cool and what I think is relevant. And I don't think that my taste is contingent on my gayness. And just because I want to tell a story that's gay, I don't necessarily think that means it's niche. Yeah, of course, of course. Do you think, obviously, um, a lot of some of the uh, things that you look at and the characters that you've formed in a lot of the content you've made is to some sense is autobiographical in the way that you use or kind of been influenced by yourself in the way that you produce some of the characters um, but obviously having to be slightly removed from that what would you kind of advice would you give to people who were going to base kind of their protagonists on themselves but kind of obviously need that distance they need to characterize them to kind of make them fulfilling and good characters in their piece of work you know what, where's the line there you know what what did you do to kind of be able to use that but step back from it as well well like then the minute you write something down it becomes fictional because it's it's uh, subjective, it's your opinion of the truth, it's your perspective on yourself. 
and also you mold it like clay like you write like I could write down exactly what this talk is between you and me and then I would go over it a million times to elevate it to something that is worthy of a scene you know like I think it's I think it's about making an event of the banal and like the pieces of your life. I don't know, it's funny that I'm doing this this week that I've had such an intense, like, like, I mean, telling my mother that her mother was dead. Like, it felt like I was in a movie. I, like I had forgotten for a minute why I make such personal work and then that happened and I was like, oh, I forgot. Iranians are so extra. Like <laughs> we're just all in a movie all the time. And the way that we react to things is so huge. And you start to see like sometimes, I think what attracts me to this genre of like auto fiction is the ways in which the banal or the typical can become extraordinary and universal and maybe not banal, but the personal. And the way human behavior like breaks down into not just being about that moment, but about so much history, about so much more, like the meat of the way people are the way they are. Um, it takes a shape and then you have to make it work within the structure of your narrative. Like you start with the truth, you start with exactly your perspective of how it happened, and then you work it into the framework of 90 minutes, and then you rework it, and then you rework it until it no longer bears resemblance to where it started. But the kernel and the detail is the truth. I know that's not answering this question, like this is a really backwards way of answering it, but like, I think that all writing, even when it has no resemblance to your life as you've experienced it, is deeply, deeply, deeply personal. Like anytime you spend time with a filmmaker, like have dinner with a filmmaker, you're like, oh, you are your films. Like, it is so clear that we are what we make. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, but also, but I mean, I'm sorry, I, I have a bigger point, which is to say that like, I'm really drawn to the truth and the absurd and how the worst things in life are laced, or like the fun, sorry, the funniest things in life are kind of laced in despair and laced in like self-hatred. And I wanna find where that links and explore that. And when it starts in the on the page, it's quite literal. Um, but then I also wanna say that like, even if you're writing something about cops and robbers, I think the best films about cops and robbers are the ones that feel so like disgustingly personal. Like if you're really gonna do it, then like, I think you need to inject something deeply, deeply personal or else it becomes paint by numbers, no? Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah, definitely. And how have you find the context that you've gone to um, with, because obviously you're working on the set both with the actors as a director, but often acting yourself um, and having obviously been taking the role of a writer. How do you feel, you know, is there anything that you do in particular when you're working with actors to kind of help get the best performance from them to help make them feel relaxed on set is there anything that you kind of do and does that kind of tie in with you actually being on screen as well how has that kind of worked for you on set previously so being on screen while directing is stupid like it's a hundred percent stupid and i don't recommend anyone does it and i don't know if i'm going to do it again in my life it is not helpful to anybody it's not helpful to the other actors. Like, I think after I made appropriate behavior, like my party line was like, ooh, I get to take the temperature in the room and I, I'm in the scenes, so I'm, I'm molding it as I'm in it. And it's just not true. Like now that I've had the experience of making Cameron Post, which I'm not in, and then going back to making the bisexual so quickly afterwards I, that I was in, I was like, oh no, this sucks. Like I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not as good at my job when I am in and so over uh, utilized. Like it, I think what it is to be a director is to be a curator who is constantly taking the temperature. They're like every second of the day, and you're also like a conductor. 
you you look around and you're like okay what is each each element need like do i need to like does does art need me to like crescendo do they need me to get the fuck out of their way do like do you need here and the same is true for your actors i think every actor is different and it's your job as a director to read how to work them and so that's how you do it you do it on your feet and you cast according to what you need and you take the temperature you feel it out and it's it's different every day it's different with each performer it's different with each scene and that's the reason i love it like i think it's a job that brings out the best in me because that's how i feel on set that said that's how i work like every director is totally different and i didn't quite discover how i work until i got to cameron post where i had the space to do it um for the things that i've been in we were just hitting the ground running and i think i did take the temperature a lot in the scene where I was able to, because there's a different hierarchy when you're on screen as well, and you're able to look at someone as a peer, whereas when you're just directing and watching, you're a voyeur. You're not where they are. You're not in the trenches. You can't look to someone and talk to them like you know what they're going through. And so my approach was really different when I was on screen with people versus when I wasn't. Um, so yeah. It's really uh, stupid, hard to do it when you're acting and you won't, I didn't, it took making the TV show for me to realize that. And how has that kind of switch between feature films to television been for you? Is, do you have a particular preference those formats? Is there anything about them that kind of stood apart for you? Um, I didn't realize it until this year. So like, if, t if making a movie is like making love to someone who like, you've been together long enough that they know your body and you've said I love you but it's still fresh enough that like you're excited like it hasn't gone into autopilot yet if that's making an art house like independent feature making television is going to the red light district on a Tuesday afternoon like not the light like it's still bright out she's kind of phoning it in you're just getting your dick sucked. It's awful. It just could not be less romantic, less, it's so rushed. It's truly, truly a sprint. And um, it really comes at you. And I have that, I've had that experience as both a director of my own show that I was show running and a director for hire. That it's just all, systems go like no time to think 40 things going on at once so that there's just no real like i feel the choices you get to be really meticulous with a movie of course my the films i shot went quickly and we bitched and moaned about not having enough time but there was there was um you had just those 90 minutes to shape, you know? You had that many days to shape that many minutes. And that's what you focused on. And you made no money doing it. On television, you're compensated very well for your time. Well, in America, you're compensated a lot better. But even in the UK, you're compensated. You're in, in some kind of way that you can pay your rent. Um, but you are filling hours and hours of time and a lot of the shit you shoot is even not even going to make the cut, but you shoot so much of it. It is so overwritten, or at least the stuff I've done has been overwritten. The, the stuff that I wrote, I will say, I won't speak for other people's writing. I overwrote my show and you are just gasping for breath and running as fast as you can. And you have no time to look back and it doesn't matter if you got it or you didn't get it. You have to move on. It is, it was horrifying. All the experiences I've had have been so rushed and um, it's intense. Mm -hmm. How did you find, did you get, with Miss Education of Cameron Post, obviously that was adapted screenplay rather than original screenplay. Was there a kind of difference there in terms of the way that you went through that writing process? Was there kind of more to that? I thought it was going to be so much easier than it was. 
<laughs> I really stupidly was like, well, the structure's there. Well, it's a book. All I have to do is like change the format and I'm done. And that was not the case. It was so stupid and naive of me to think that. It required so much shaping. I mean, the approach was different in that like Chichili and I wrote an outline first and we hadn't really outlined before that before. And I'm talking about from when I started writing as like a nine year old, like I, I started writing scripts, like theater scripts for lunchtime, um, really young. And I always started with people talking and in the scripts I wrote in college and in grad school, I was always really, and with appropriate behavior, it was always like two people in a room, what's going to happen next? Let's see. And with Cameron Post, it was like, okay, we have this structure to fill. I knew the book is 500 pages and covers, what is it, like 10 years in this or like five years in this girl's life. Mm -hmm. The movie covers the last 200 pages of the book and about like, I forget what the calendar timeline is now, but it's, it can't be more than like eight months. Mm -hmm. so it'd be like eight months of her life. But it's a really condensed period of time and the journey at God's promise because in the book starts when she's 11 and it covers so much of her life. But the, I always knew that if I was going to adapt it, I, I felt specifically interested in adapting her time at the rehabilitation center. So it brought structure into what I did. And, but also trying to craft a narrative around the journey of her going into God's promise was, um, was the problem of that film. And it wasn't solved in the script stage. It ended up becoming solved in the edit. Like, I feel like the film we shot didn't, it wasn't very clear what her journey was. And I think that's one of, now that I've like judged a couple of like, of um, awards things and film festival things and, struggled a lot with my own work. I think my main issue as is a viewer and a filmmaker is always like, let's just get that thesis statement out there. Like, who is this person? What is their problem? What is their journey? Like, give me something to bite into. And it's so basic and stupid, but it's also comforting as a viewer. And I think that's something that we failed to do in script stage and had to rewire into post, in Cameron Post. And the post on that took twice as long as we had originally thought. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a lot of reshaping her narrative. I see. It sounds, yeah, it's like more complicated. Did you, what kind of hooked you into that novel in the first place? What kind of really incentivized you to be part of that production? Um, so I got an, a copy of the book from a book editor I knew who was like, I think you'll like this. And I loved it and I shared it with my girlfriend and at the time and my girlfriend at the time was like oh you need to make this into a movie and i thought it was too like mature for me not i mean it's a teen film but it's to me it was really uh, delicate the tone and the balance between the tragedy and the comedy and what this girl was going through and also i didn't grow up religious so i was really intimidated by the idea of tackling a story about evangelical christians but then as I was traveling with appropriate behavior, this was years later, like two years later, I was, I had made appropriate behavior and I was traveling with Cecilia and I gave the book to her and I said, you know, this star thinks that we should adapt this. I don't know. I don't think it's, it's something we should, I think it's a fourth film. I don't think it's a second film. Um, we need to earn it. What do you think? And the minute she, she read it in like a week and said, we're doing this. And so honestly, it was peer pressure. <laughs> so I'm glad. Like, I, but it was up until like a, a week before we got when was it like I remember it was I had already like flown myself to the states because I was living in London at the time and I really didn't believe in myself like I really didn't believe that I could pull it off and there were many times where I told Cecilia I don't think I'm good enough for this like I don't think I have this in me and it really, and I'll say, I'll say that for now, I'll be straight up with you. God, I hope, I know you're recording. I don't know where this is going to end up, but whatever. Uh, I, even the thing I'm writing right now, 
like it scares the shit out of me and there are times where I'm like oh god am I in over my head like who the fuck do I think I am to tell a story like right now I'm writing something that we're going to translate into Farsi that takes place in Iran during the 70s that is about a moment in history that I was not a part of and often I, I know I'm going to be skewered by some Iranians that's just a fact and there are moments where I'm like who the fuck do I think I am? This is a mistake. I should, I should do anything else. And then I remember how I felt about Cameron Post, the August, so we shot in October, November. And I remember how I felt in August because I was shooting a horror film. I was acting in this horror film called Creep 2. Mm -hmm. And I remember like on my time off from that, I was looking through names. We were like making offers for the cast on Cameron Post. We had no cast um, attached. And I was, I kept thinking, this isn't gonna happen. Like this is, I'm not up for this. Like I, I'm gonna fail you and we're never gonna make this work. And it's remembering how much self doubt there was that um, really, confirms that those insecurities are part of the process. And I feel, I mean, incredibly proud of Cameron Post and what that is. And, and I, I, I was the person to tell that story. And I, 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 as I said, I think self-doubt is part of the process. It's just why I'm sharing that anecdote. Yeah, of course. I think everyone has that sort of imposter syndrome at some point where you kind of feel like, why am I here? <laughs> Do I, should I be here? But I think that's really kind of must be reassuring for everyone to know that everyone feels that at some point. <laughs> Do you think, um, kind of moving on now to um, talking about the kind of larger context of, obviously you've had this opportunity to move forward from your first feature, and there's definitely a lot of kind of conversation at the moment around um, female filmmakers and getting past that kind of initial stage of the first feature, and that they're kind of, they're there in shorts, so they're there at some dance, they're there in this kind of initial stage, but they just don't make it that much further have you got any sort of insight on that or are you seeing any sort of changes in terms of the way that female filmmakers are being represented i don't have a good party line for that like why there's that drop off <sighs> like i will say that i've seen more of my male counterparts take on films that didn't matter to them as much films that weren't like home runs in their book but that they were like it's just my second film i'll go on to make more like this is a drop in the puddle of my uh and then for the women it was like no i'm very precious about this like what i do next is my brand is my calling card might be the last time i'm on set and i want to make it matter uh that's if i'm going to generalize definitely a perspective i've seen and i don't know I, if I can make a judgment call on that. I was offered a lot of work after um, Cameron Post that I said no to. And some of that work was much bigger budget than I've ever seen, but it didn't feel like me. And I've seen, and it does definitely, and I don't know if this is a result of being a woman. I just, I just, believe that the like why take up space why take up two hours of someone's life unless you have something to say and you need to say it urgently and it matters and it hasn't been said before the way you can say it and i don't know if that sentiment is shared with my male counterparts and i think that there's definitely a feeling of like abundance of like well i'll just make another thing and it'll be fine mm -hmm. so like that's a tricky thing but it's hard for me to make that gendered I don't know. I mean, I think you should ask that of execs, but I'm always asked this question and I never quite know what to say. I will say that like making that second feature, just like making the, I mean, I think making the first feature is harder. I think it's a myth that making the second feature is the harder one. It's just not true. It, you have a point, of, like you have a body of work that speaks for you. You have something that's a calling card. Why would it be harder? Um, it's hard though. Like I think, and by hard, I mean, there are compromises to be made. I wanted to make Cameron Post for four times, like I had written it to cost four times as much as it did. I did not expect to make it so bare bones. Mm -hmm. um, but it was sort of that triangle of like fast, 
like do you make it quickly make it at with creative control or make it um like get the budget you want so it was like i'm willing to sacrifice the budget i want so that i can move quickly and have some creative control like it's always like a dance of like okay well i'm going what what can i lean on like we were supposed to shoot in montana we didn't shoot in montana we were supposed to do a lot of things we didn't do those things the film was still had the integrity that it needed to be what it was um it's i think a lot of directing is definitely knowing where to compromise and where to not compromise and um for me that story didn't need a lot of money to support it and, but I did need a lot of creative freedom. And always, if you're willing to take less money, you're gonna be making, you're gonna be making more choices for yourself. And then in, in terms of the timeline, like I didn't want to keep going out to more and more financiers. I only wanted to do one round of showing the script around and I did. Do you think there was any sort of particular point where you really felt that you'd kind of defined or got to know your own voice as a filmmaker? Was there any sort of stage where you were like, or part of your writing process where you were kind of like, oh no, this is, this is making me feel like I sort of know who I am as a filmmaker? In my career with Cameron Post? I think just generally through, through the films, has there kind of been a point where you've really kind of gone, okay, this is the point that really sort of defines who I am or kind of really kind of allowed you to feel like you've got a voice. No, I mean, I for sure on Cameron Post, I had the space to figure out what it was that made me tick as a director because I felt like I was really directing in a way that was much more defined than when I'm on screen as well. But with each thing, you shed a little bit more of your reservation and your insecurity and you, you fall into it. And even when you have a shoot that's difficult or painful, you learn a little more about what you need and, and what you excel at and how to get the support when you're hitting a tough spot. It's a lot like puberty. I mean, I think this is a job where self-knowledge is really important and knowing your limitations and knowing your your superpowers is something that helps you get through each day but i also don't think it's overnight i don't think it's like a light switch going off it's a craft and it's true of any industry in any position where you're going to have some defining triumphs and some defining failures and each one is going to help you figure out a little more what matters to you and why you do what you do the way you do it. I think we've probably got time for maybe one more question. So I've got one here around transitioning to working in the UK and how you found that process and how you, maybe you found it in terms of the way your work's been received by different audiences and different places. I'm not gonna lie, that's a really hard question for me to answer. <laughs> <laughs> was there I, anything you found kind of really obviously different when you kind of moved to the UK in terms of the way that the industry works? Oh, or, yeah. yeah. Like, I have an answer. I'm just saying I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> no, I'll talk about it. Um, so when I first came to the UK, it was with appropriate behavior and it was 2015. And I felt embraced in a way that I hadn't in the States. I felt like I was finding an audience and I was getting support in a way I hadn't before. And I moved there very quickly. Like I just didn't go back home. Um, then, so then I was in development for years and writing on my own and the development was fantastic and the writing support was fantastic. And I feel like I wrote scripts I really believe in. It wasn't until I actively was on set in the UK and working there and then released a show there that I realized that I was a foreigner and I wasn't welcome. It wasn't until I saw the response to my show that I felt unwelcome. And it wasn't until I had conflict with people where money was involved that I felt like the way that people engaged with conflict and with business was so
indirect and that I was perceived as wildly inappropriate because I wanted to have direct conflict or direct like hammering out of our opinions and our emotions and there was such a communication like breakdown between my Middle Eastern <laughs> fire and American <laughs> bluntness versus the English sensibility and it was the biggest challenge I've had professionally. Well, you're definitely over it now. <laughs> I think your work's obviously resonated so well with UK audiences. I think it's, oh, it's good you got there. You got through it with them. <laughs> you kind of got to be able to make the work that you did. Thank you. Thanks. No, but I don't think the UK loved the bisexual. I, it did a lot better in the States than it did in the UK. I'll be honest, it didn't do well there. It wasn't reviewed well there. It wasn't loved. I wasn't loved. And like, that was... The truth, I moved, I got my visa revoked and I left. I mean, that's really disappointing knowing how much I personally loved it. And I know loads of people, especially on this chat, would have done as well. You know, I mean, for me, it was a huge kind of groundbreaking piece of work to see. Even just the fact that someone had titled something The Bisexual was, for me, just quite a turning point um, in terms of just seeing that on. But I will on. say this too. It's, I wouldn't have been able to get greenlit to make The Bisexual in the US. And I know that because I pitched it there and it was rejected. It was it really like, it was, I will never like forget and stop being appreciative of the fact that it was greenlit there and that Channel 4 took a risk on me. Mm. But there, unfortunately, the risk they took didn't pay them back. And I feel sad about that for sure. Um, but I still think that like, you know, the UK brought us pulling, like brought us all these shows that influenced me in a really big way. And yeah, so definitely. And I some of those, like you say, don't guess, don't always get past season one, but are just kind of really stand out in terms of kind of cult followings and just kind of really kind of having a, a kind of noticeable kind of support for it, I think. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. I, I have a, I mean, clearly I have a lot of big feelings about the UK and working <laughs> in the UK. And um, I will always be a really big fan of the crazy risks that shows take out there. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, yeah, we're glad, we're glad they took the risk on you at the time and really looking forward to see what you do next. Is there anything that you can push us towards? Any little insights of, do you know when things might start taking place or are you not in production yet? Are you still Does anybody writing? know when things are going to start taking place in the world? I mean, I would be really impressed if you found anyone who had that answer. <laughs> 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 well, it's great to know that you're still being able to work and you're still kind of writing and keeping busy with everything. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us today thank and getting through. We got through quite a few questions. Thank you, it's fun. <laughs> thank you so much, Desiree. It was really great having thank you. Thank you. Me. Thank you. And don't quote me on any of this stuff. I will get in trouble if people find <laughs> out what I said. It's between us and all the attendees. <laughs> it's like a circle of trust. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Desiree. Thank you everyone for, for listening in and joining in with us today. Thanks. <laughs>